Hello, and welcome to the Scholars at Risk 2020 Global Congress in virtual format. I am Claire Robinson, Advocacy Director at Scholars at Risk. Our next session on teaching academic freedom will begin in a few moments, but first I have a few standard housekeeping items to share. Scholars at Risk is recording this session and we'll be placing this online for anyone unable to join us today. We welcome audience questions at any time. To submit a question, please use the Q&A portal at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You are able to submit questions anonymously if you prefer. Due to the compressed schedule of the virtual Congress, we may not be able to answer every question. You can also submit technical questions about using Zoom through the Q&A portal or over email to scholarsatrisk at nyu.edu. We also encourage all of you to contribute to the social media conversation in parallel with the sessions. And if you do, please tag Scholars at Risk and use the hashtag SARCongress2020. And now I'm delighted to introduce our next session titled Teaching Academic Freedom. The session will highlight efforts to integrate academic freedom into undergraduate and graduate courses through Scholars at Risk's student advocacy seminars and legal clinics. For those of you interested in exploring modules helpful for teaching academic freedom, I encourage you to take SAR's free online course, Dangerous Questions, Why Academic Freedom Matters. The course will run again beginning April 20th through the Future Learn platform. Now on to our panel. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Bob Cole, who is moderating this session. Bob is a professor at Roger Williams University in Rhode Island where he is chair of the Department of Communication, Graphic Design and Web Development. Bob taught a student advocacy seminar this past fall, and I'm delighted that he has offered to share his experiences with us here today. Thank you, Bob, for all your support of SAR and for leading this discussion. I'll turn the session over to you. Claire, thank you very much, and thank you to everybody who's making the Global Congress of Virtual Reality. Uh, we structured the panel so that we'll spend uh, maybe 30 minutes or so talking about our experiences with the advocacy, student advocacy seminar, and then we'll invite um, the audience to ask questions and we'll answer uh, the ones that we can. Let me begin, though, by asking the other panelists to very briefly introduce themselves and uh, preview what they'll be talking about. Lawrence? Hi, Bob. Uh, well, first of all, um, I'd like to congratulate the organizers for all the efforts made to turn this into an online event. Uh, so my name is Lawrence Andres. I'm a postdoctoral researcher connected to the Human Rights Center of Ghent University. Uh, my area of expertise uh, is the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, I did not have a particular expertise regarding academic freedom, freedom until I became involved in supervising a project in co collaboration with SAR in the context of our legal clinic, and that's what I'll talk to you about later. Thank you, Lawrence. Federica? Good afternoon. My name is Federica Tadevini, and I'm a student from Italy. I'm currently studying, studying uh, international studies at the University of Trento. Last year, I participated in the first cycle of academic freedom seminars organized by SAR in collaboration with the University of Trento. So I'm here today to share the student's perspective on what it's like to learn about academic freedom through the advocacy seminar. Moreover, I will also focus on the importance to share the knowledge acquired with other members of academia and with civil society. I would like to take a moment to thank Sar for giving me the opportunity to talk on this panel and for organizing this online version of the Congress. So thank you. Good. Thank you very much. And I'm Robert Cole. As Claire mentioned, I'm a professor in communication studies and I teach organizational communication, social movements, uh, peace studies. And this past fall, I did get the chance to teach our human rights student advocacy seminar. I need to acknowledge my indebtedness to Professor Adam Braver. He's the coordinator of SAR student advocacy seminars, and he also chairs the SAR uh, United States Steering Committee. Uh, Adam and I are campus colleagues, and so over the years I've seen his sustained efforts to really infuse the student advocacy seminars uh, into uh, becoming an ongoing part of our institution's curricula. 
So uh, the learning objectives for my own course were built around the framework of the publication that SAR makes available in their resource center. It's uh, called Student Advocacy Seminars, Educating the Next Generation of Human Rights Leaders. And uh, student activities and deliverables for the advocacy seminars really are that students research uh, at least one case of an imprisoned scholar. They set up plans to monitor the case. They engage in ongoing uh, organizing and ongoing advocacy initiatives. And then they prepare an end of semester report or a capstone event of some kind. For the past fall semester on my campus, we decided to run that course as a one credit fall class. And we met for about an hour and a half each week. And then the students had anywhere from two to three hours worth of work outside of the classroom. And then we're continuing that course this spring. And that runs where students can either elect one credit or three credits. So in the um, fall semester, I really had four outcomes in mind. And that was, first of all, I wanted to raise students' awareness, general awareness uh, to the fact that um, scholars are being imprisoned throughout the world. And um, the students drew on SARS annual free to think and obstacles of excellence reports. Uh, they looked at reports from other student advocacy seminars. Uh, I asked them to read Adam Braver's book on Ilham Todi, the Sarkov Prize winner and imprisoned Uyghur economist. The, the second uh, uh, outcome I had for the course was really to get the students to deepen their understanding of the concept of academic freedom and why it matters. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. Uh, third, um, working with um, SAR and Professor Braver students as an outcome selected a current case that they were going to uh, attend and they began the actual plan for monitoring and conducting uh, advocacy work. And then uh, to finish the one credit uh, semester uh, after having done a deep dive into all the discoverable information they engaged in awareness raising and advocacy at a local and regional level through social media strategies, publicity campaigns, and so forth. So the first semester ended with the um, students preparing a handoff package to the spring cohort of students coming in and giving them strategies for carrying out national and international awareness and advocacy initiatives, which is what they're engaged in at the moment. So let me talk for a moment about um, academic freedom activities I used during the semester. And really, I was trying to bring into relief for the students what's at stake uh, on this topic and, and why does it matter if there are limits to freedoms to think and speak. So the first activity um, was uh, just a basic exploration of under what conditions does the U.S. Constitution allow in this country uh, restrictions on freedom of speech. And so we got an understanding uh, of what uh, those rare cases are when constitutionally you can limit speech. Then I also um, passed out a couple of articles from the New York Times that dealt with recent contested cases of freedom of speech. And I picked those because I wanted to make them salient to the students themselves. So one of them addressed attempts by professional and amateur athletes to express their own beliefs through physical demonstrations like kneeling or fist raising. And the second New York Times story dealt with um, the issue of hosting campus speakers and what uh, the latitude of tolerance should be balanced against considerations of safety and also students' rights to counter expression. And so that um, engendered lively discussions, I think began in a tangible way uh, as the students looked at the immediate world around them to begin to understand. But then I really wanted to uh, move the ball a little bit more. And so I have an assignment where I ask the students to dig into the academic literature on uh, academic freedom and what scholarships have been done. And so they need to provide me with a write-up of an academic journal article that they have found in which they clearly state what was a hypothesis of the research uh, or research question that the author undertook. In other words, what academic freedom aspect did the author deal with? They need to describe in their write-up how the research was conducted or whether it was a meta-analysis. In other words, how, what was the design to answer the research questions about academic freedom? They needed to uh, summarize the findings that the authors claimed 
and just as importantly, what were the implications or relevance of that finding? And then I asked them to comment on uh, the strengths and weaknesses of that article. Now, that was fine. That's a privatized experience, one student, one article. But then I also moved another step. And so to start every seminar each week, I had one or two students prepare a 10 minute presentation to all the other students about that topic that they had researched. And so they also unpacked these same questions and then they had structured questions to engage the audience response for another five minutes or so with direct questions uh, and prompts for the audience. And so at the end of the seminar, everybody had heard 12 or 13 other pieces of scholarship on the topic of academic freedom. Uh, I'll just quickly give you some bullet points of some of the topics that were covered in those literature reviews, the variance of concepts of university tenure and academic freedom in different parts of the world, the notion that some universities over time have moved their missions away from pure academia and research and more towards a business and what how that internally weakens the uh, concept of academic freedom within an institution. The relationship between pr protected speech in the classroom and either an open or an impoverished learning students for the stu uh, learning experience for the students themselves and uh, considerations of cybersecurity data encryption rights uh, individual to individual privacy uh, and all uh, how all those have an impact on uh, the intellectual freedom scholars today. Um, I don't want to go on long. I want to make sure and spend plenty of time uh, listening to my colleagues, but I do want to quickly read some um, reflections and uh, I'll read the quotes on these from the students when we were done. On the first day of class, I was a little overwhelmed by what was about to happen in the course because it seemed as though we were about to embark on a task that would take years to chip away. Now I see how small organizations like our class can come together and create something much larger and more meaningful. There's no direct way for a student like myself to convince another government to let a scholar go. Rather, SAR calls upon groups of students to raise awareness to people who can make a difference. And finally, I never realized how large the SAR network was. And now that I've been introduced to it, I am amazed how far its reach is. It's easy to join something like this and feel too small to make a difference. But once I realized what we could do, I felt like we could make a difference. So thank you. And uh, I'll turn the floor over to Lawrence. To me first or to Federica? Or... Pardon me? Sorry. Uh, maybe it's better to start with Federica, no? Since Very good. also on the student advocacy. Very good. Yeah. Thank you to both of you. As I mentioned before in my short intervention, I will start by synthesizing how to build up academic freedom knowledge during the course of an academic freedom seminar and subsequently how to share this expertise with civil society. When undergoing my bachelor's degree here in Italy, I've noticed that zero universities offer specific curricular courses on the theme of academic freedom. Some universities do offer courses on human rights, but what I find is that these courses do not or refer just little to the topic of academic freedom. Moreover, usually these classes are offered by humanistic departments. Therefore, students from the scientific fields might be excluded from it, creating a sort of bias in the comprehension of their rights. In this sense, scholars and risk advocacy seminars offer a unique opportunity for students to understand the value of academic freedom through classes and direct engagement in advocacy activities. As you may know, SAR seminars are structured in different parts, one of which is usually dedicated to understand academic freedom. This section of the seminar is pivotal because it enables students to construct their knowledge on the topic. For example, by knowing how the topic of academic freedom developed during the course of history, what are the national and international legal bases that protect and defend academic freedom? What are the theoretical approaches to academic freedom? Alongside driving students' interest on the topic, learning about academic freedom is necessary to prepare the students for the advocacy activities. Especially when interacting with people, students must be prepared and have the knowledge to answer any kind of question. And where they're asking people to share their support in front of the class, for example, by signing a petition or sharing a post online, students must be sure that people are conscious of what they're doing if their action might have any consequences. An aspect that really drove my attention while I was learning about academic freedom is how multifaceted this topic is. On the one hand, academic freedom represents the right 
to scientific research, which also includes the right to choose freely the topic of the research without any ideological or political limitations. On the other hand, scientific research does not complete in the research activity itself, but as a second purpose, which is to share information and knowledge. Not only scholars research, research for the sake or the sake of academia, but also for society, which can benefit from scholars' discoveries, of course. Therefore, academic freedom is not a right held only by members of academia, but by everybody who enjoys academic results. Academic freedom violations should not be defended only by members of the higher education community, but by civil society too. I strongly believe it is important to try to help people to become more conscious of the rights they have. So during the course of, of the seminar I participated in, we tried to develop people's consciousness by creating an academic freedom board game. Some of you might have seen a video of one of my colleagues trying presenting it. I know it was published on our profiles. Since the target of these activities were not members of the academia, but common people, we decided to plan something that could be entertaining, but instructive at the same time. On the board, we drew a map of the world and we selected some countries in which academic freedom violation occurred. We deliberately chose the countries and the violations taking in consideration the significance of it, the political system of the state, whether it was democratic rather than authoritarian, and the geographical position. The aim of the game was to match the description of a case of violation with a country in which it happened. Our aim was to break the stereotypes that academic freedom violation only occur in non-democratic states in which the rule of law is undermined or non-existent. We presented cases in Italy, in France, in the UK, in the US, in China, in India, in Iran, and many more. The idea of creating a game was successful. Both people and adults, so children and adults, decided to play, and while they were playing, they were also learning. So to conclude, as a student, learning about academic freedom has been central for my formative development. I've understood what it means, what are the limits to academic freedom, and what are the threats it faces every day. This was possible thanks to SAR Students Advocacy Seminars, since I would not have developed such knowledge through a curricular course. I feel now ready to share the expertise I've gained with civil society, as it's also my duty. So thank you very much. Frederica, thank you very much. And I did get a chance to see your game. It was very, uh, mm -hmm. very exciting. Uh, Lawrence, we'll turn things over to you. Okay, thanks, Bob. Um, so, yes, I'd like to share some of my experiences uh, in collaborating with Zar as a coach uh, in our legal clinic at the Human Rights Center of Ghent University. Um, so let me first say something uh, on our legal clinic. Uh, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with the concept of a legal clinic, uh, clinical legal education is a method of uh, teaching law that is based on practice-oriented learning and that also aims to promote social justice at the same time. Um, within our Human Rights Center, we decided to jump uh, on the legal clinic bandwagon in 2014 uh, with a view to inno uh, innovating human rights law education. Uh, the legal uh, clinic is integrated in the curriculum of the law school and students receive credits for their participation. Within our legal clinic, we mainly do projects in collaboration, in collaboration with civil society organizations, such as SAR. Um, our students wor work on these projects in groups of three to five students under the supervision of an academic staff member. Uh, I've been involved in supervising projects in collaboration with SAR uh, during the two previous academic years. So I'll tell you something about what we've done uh, now. Um, so in our collaboration with ZAR, uh, we've mainly focused on assisting ZAR in its advocacy uh, work at the United, at the United Nations. Um, at the level of the UN Human Rights Council, every five years, uh, each state has to undergo the so-called Universal Periodic Review, or UPR. Um, the UPR is an intergovernmental process in which states are subjected to some kind of peer review uh, of their human rights records by the representatives of other states uh, who can make recommendations to improve this record. Uh, the review takes place based on a country report submitted by the state itself, on a report uh, by the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, and also on the basis of a report
files input by civil society actors. Our terms of provide input to the academic field is, uh, is, is limited, to so itself is limited, but collaborating with legal clinics as ours uh, is a way for ZAR to uh, expand its reach. Um, under my, so what do we do? So under my supervision, uh, students work on compiling reliable information on the state of academic freedom in the country concerned, uh, which is then clustered together to identify particular areas of concern. We're in contact with uh, Jessa Levine, uh, Senior Advocacy uh, Officer at ZAR, uh, who then provides input on uh, the findings. Uh, taking into account this feedback, uh, the students then pr uh, proceed to the actual writing of the draft submissions to the UPR process. And then in the final stage, it is ZAR itself that does the final editing before submitting to the United Nations. So during my first year as a coach in our legal clinic, uh, the work of my students formed the basis of SARS UPR submissions on Ethiopia. Um, at the time, there were widespread pressures on uh, academic freedom in, in Ethiopia, resulting mainly from the abuse of state of emergency powers and of very broad uh, anti-terrorism legislation, uh, which were, for instance, used as a basis to arrest and detain scholars. Uh, last year, my students worked on ZAR's UPR submissions regarding Turkey, uh, which, as you all know, is confronted with an unprecedented attack on higher education in the context of the crackdown uh, on the signatories of the Academics for Peace uh, petition and also in the context of the measures taken in the aftermath of the 2016 failed coup attempt. As we were working on academic freedom in Turkey uh, already, we also seized the opportunity to submit a third party intervention uh, before the European Court of Human Rights in the case of Telek and others v. Turkey. It's a case that is still pending before the European Court of Human Rights. So in this third party intervention, which was a joint uh, submission by uh, our Human Rights Center and ZAR, we invited the court to reaffirm and more fully articulate the express recognition of uh, academic freedom under the European Convention on Human Rights. Regarding the UPR submissions on Turkey, I can already inform you that these have been a big success. Um, before the Turkish UPR, apparently only three recommendations uh, concerning academic freedom have ever been made in all previous UPRs uh, combined. But regarding Turkey, however, six states have made a recommendation with an academic freedom dimension. So this signifies an important step uh, in the further recognition of academic freedom as a distinct human rights concern at the UN level. There, however, still are a lot of possibilities for further advocacy work at the UN. Uh, and in this regard, I would like to draw the attention uh, to the work of my colleague, Andrea Spagnolo from the University of Turin, uh, who together with the students uh, of his legal clinic is currently exploring possibilities um, to also put academic uh, freedom on the agenda of the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. Now, what have the students taken away from this experience? Um, our ZAR co uh, collaboration perfectly fits within the aims of uh, our legal clinic to allow our students to gain an understanding of the potential role of socially oriented legal professionals in addressing social problems and to develop practical legal skills, in particular uh, advocacy skills in an international environment. Um, the international dimension of the project is particularly um, motivating for the students as it allows them to engage with human rights concerns in a country of which they would otherwise often have little uh, to no awareness. And importantly, um, in their evaluation, students have indicated uh, that their work has contributed to increasing their awareness of the importance of academic freedom, as well as their awareness of the existence of pressures on academic freedom worldwide. Um, finally, I would like to draw the attention to the fact uh, that Bob has created the Google Drive folder, which contains a number of materials that could be uh, of use for anybody interested in undertaking a similar project. Um, it includes some introductory texts on academic freedom from uh, a human rights law perspective, uh, but also some of the materials created by our students in the context of our collaboration with SAR. Um, if you have further questions, uh, I can respond to them to, during the Q&A.
but also please contact me via email uh, if you are interested in setting up a similar project. It shouldn't be too difficult to find me. Just Google me and send me an email. Uh, and I'm very willing to further share my experiences with you. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Lawrence, thank you very much. Um, I want to share with the audience that if you're thinking about putting together your own student advocacy seminar, whether for credit or whether as a non-credit uh, ancillary to some of the other things you're doing, uh, SAR, uh, SAR has some fantastic uh, um, uh, pieces of material that will really help you tailor uh, a course to your own expertise and to the sensibility of the particular audience and particular students that uh, that you imagine uh, would take that course. So I would uh, really encourage you to look at the opportunity. And as we heard from Frederica, it's very satisfying for the students. And I think Lawrence and I will both say it's very satisfying uh, work as, as an instructor. Uh, before we move to questions and answers, I, I do wanna ask both of you um, to, um, Imagine in a minute or two, what would you do differently or how would you adapt uh, human rights advocacy, learning and teaching, academic freedom, learning and teaching? How would you adapt that to this really remote environment we find ourselves in now where we're physically distancing and to some extent we're having to uh, socially distant and rely on virtual networks? So maybe uh, we'll start with Frederica. How, how might you imagine this would impact a student's learning? I think you're muted. So, excuse me. <laughs> no, no. Taking in consideration the current international situation, running a student advocacy seminar could be a challenge now. Surely all the in-person events must be rethought through the concept of social distancing. So since physical events must be avoided, I would suggest to use this time to develop social media profiles now more than ever, people are connected on social media. So I think it would be worth to spend some time creating a web page in which to share contents and information and maybe to start initiatives such as sending letters to one scholar's prisons, which can easily be done from home. Regarding learning aspects, since it's a time in which both students and professors have to take classes online, I would avoid adding too much work so it could be interesting to suggest lectures on academic freedom to students to do it voluntarily in their spare time. And at the same time, maybe the MOOC course online could be made available for students. So if they want to access it, they could have the information. So hopefully they can start building up the knowledge and in the near future start advocating. Okay, that's very encouraging to hear Frederica, that our work doesn't have to stop then. It sounds like there can still be a good experience for the students. Lawrence, what are your thoughts? Um, well, so I'm in Belgium, in which country a lockdown is in place. Uh, myself, I'm, I'm not currently uh, coaching at our legal clinic, but uh, so I don't have any personal experiences with the situation. But I've, I've heard from my colleagues uh, that they have fully switched to video conferencing tools. Um, uh, in Belgium, we don't really have the culture of using video conferencing uh, a lot. So it, of course, it inevitably uh, takes some time to just get used to the differences in, in interaction um, that you get. I think what's important, I think, is that we should be very conscious of the fact that living in these circumstances, in particular this lo these lockdown situations that we have here, that it's a source of, of anxiety for many people, including for our students. I think that's something we should be uh, as coaches, uh, as educators, we should be particularly uh, empathetic for when we interact um, with our students. Um, in terms of maybe, uh, yeah, let's say that's to end on a positive note, note, maybe as a result of this massive switch to video conferencing tools, the threshold to talk to somebody living at the other side of the world is currently as high as the threshold to talk to somebody just living uh, two blocks from you in the same city. Um, so from my experience with supervising students, well, my students, they have benefited a lot from uh, video calls they've had with scholars from the countries concerned. Um, and this really helped in uh, bringing these issues to life for them. So 
perhaps the situation offers an opportunity uh, for students to further explore uh, these options and that we as, 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 as educators can um, encourage them to explore the options of video conferencing uh, and to engage in contact with people living abroad. Um, yeah, that, um, that aligns closely with my own perspective. I am uh, continue to be amazed at um, the adeptness students have with all sorts of technologies, current and emerging, and um, the, the power of their voices to do the advocacy work really is through social media. And, you know, my, uh, my students set up a table outside the dining commons and had, passed out wristbands and had uh, tried to talk people through and help educate them about cases. But the power of their voices really came through Twitter and Facebook and, you know, other mechanisms like that. And it also really broke down the geographical boundaries of the small isolated campus where, where we are. Right. And so, so for me, then the challenge is how to build the internal community and, and um, spirit of the students who are in the advocacy seminar, because I'm less worried. And in fact, I'm encouraged by their ability to use technologies to uh, get the words out. You know, we had um, the uh, daughter of um, the, one of the imprisoned scholars came in Zoom. It was one o'clock in the morning um, be, uh, for her, but she was gracious and came into the classroom. And the, the immediacy of that, uh, you could see a shift in the in the uh, spirit of the students that all of a sudden this became a reality, the, the case that they were working on. Th these were about families and day-to-day uh, -day impacts on those families. And so I, I, I think that technology was an aid in ways that uh, not having that technology would not have allowed us to do what we, uh, what we wanted to do. So I, I'm less concerned in the same way that um, maybe this Congress could be richer if we could, uh, you know, stop and rub elbows and talk in the hallways, but there's still a, a lot to be taken away here. Um, so having said that, I'm going to try and sort through, I'm a bit of a rookie here, but I'm going to sort through the open questions. And I, I don't know, do the, uh, do, uh, Lawrence and Frederica, can you see the questions also? Yes. Okay. Um, wait. Yeah. All right, so uh, there's one about uh, that asks, are such courses mainly relevant for law students or do you have experience um, from other disciplines too? Maybe Lawrence, you could field that one? Yeah, so I mean, we're based at, at, the, at the law school, so uh, the legal clinic is only open for uh, law students. I think, I mean, because a large extent of the work that they're doing is actually monitoring work and I think it actually could be done by uh, uh, by students from other disciplines as well, but I think it is it is important to to have like a, at least a grasp of how human rights law works um, and how um, uh, the the I mean how the human rights bodies at 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 the UN level how they work um, to be able to properly do it. But I think you can prepare your students to 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 do so. It should be possible. Okay, uh, if I understand the question uh, correctly, and, and I may not, um, it, it's uh, a question, can, can these courses, can the seminars apply to a broad population and perspective of students? And while yours is a clinical um, course and students understand that it's a legal clinical basis, um, mm -hmm. Federica, I would ask in your course, did you have students from uh, multiple disciplines or was it situated just in a one discipline? No, it was actually a one discipline seminar, but okay. because we were just the first one to do it, we were just five from the political science uh, discipline. But what we found is that it would be really important to have students from other disciplines especially when running the student advocacy program and seminar, you need different um, abilities. So for example, you have to create graphic materials. Nobody, none of us had any graphic experience. Um, even presenting a team or a topic that usually understood more from the humanistic departments, it's interesting to have the scientific points of view and also a lot of uh, cases of academic freedom violations also refer to scientific knowledge. So we found a sort of flat from that part. So I would say that 
um, it would be worth to try to open up these seminars even to other disciplines. Okay. Good, thank you. What I've seen of the seminars is that they uh, come in different flavors. Some of them are situated just in a discipline. Others are multidisciplinary, inter interdisciplinary. And uh, Adam Braver shared with me the uh, mix of students he's had in past semesters. And it seems to function best when you have a couple people from graphic design because they can do that technical you know layout work you have other people who are in public relations or you have others who are political science people in the sciences and uh, all those skill sets in particular world views all come together in a in a synergistic way to really make the the class fly and uh, so I, I think the expertise of the instructor is um, really the expertise that's needed is to be a good facilitator, a good moderator, a good curator. And uh, if you're a good teacher, I think that's the sine qua non of these. And it's less about having the specific expertise in the topic. Another question is uh, it, when it comes to teaching academic freedom in a weak democracy, does anybody have any experience with that? And I'll say right off the bat that I do not. So, Lawrence, any thoughts on that? Um, no, I have no experience whatsoever. Okay. Frederica? No, um, I do not have experience. Okay. Uh, somebody asks, is there any strategy you can provide to academia to cope with censorship and academic freedom while teaching as many academia members um, are victims of what they are teaching sometimes? Either one of you want to comment on that question? It's sort of the irony of you're teaching about academic freedom and you may well be in an environment where your mm -hmm. academic freedom is uh, being shadowed. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, what, what, it, what, what you definitely, I mean, take away as, as an instructor of doing this kind of uh, project is uh, a sense of privilege of being based in a country in which you can uh, discuss, you can just do this kind of activities without having to fear um, any consequences. Um, but yeah, I don't have any experience uh, with, with, with working in such circumstances. Okay. Uh, anything you'd like to share or add, Federica? Uh, I must add that even initially, the environment is pretty open, so we don't usually face this problem. And I must also add that the faculty in general and the university administrators also support in general these sort of activities. So we didn't face any, any of these problems. Uh -huh. And uh, um, slightly related to that question, my experience has been that uh, our students don't understand academic freedom. They don't understand tenure and promotion. And for them, I think it means they're not always sure what they can demand of their uh, professors, the quality of their instruction. And uh, too often they think that because somebody's tenured that they don't that that the they don't have to have high expectations of the learning environment and I think bringing these uh, issues of academic freedom and what is still uh, n n not okay within the classroom at the micro level it is an important message even if you have lots of support from your administration to educate other students about what those boundaries are at least in your own country system I think we're out of time and we're going to try and keep the uh, uh, overall Congress uh, on pretty close to schedule. So I'd like to th thank the panelists and the audience for participating. And I want to encourage everybody to tune in to the next session, the final session, President uh, Paula Johnson of Wellesley College and Dr. Hari Han of the SNF Angora Institute at Johns Hopkins University, and also for the closing remarks from uh, scholars at risk. So again, Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you, Federica. And thank you, everybody who hung in with us.